Welcome to the science seminar this afternoon. Uh, I think this is the fifth science seminar that we've run as part of a series that's aimed at um, kind of promoting science really across and the importance of science in our decision making. And it's a real pleasure today uh, to introduce two external speakers. This is the first time we've had external speakers as part of the seminar series. And um, this really came about, as, as many of you are aware, this year, this, this um, agricultural year, or certainly hydrological year that's just about to end, has been this pretty severe drought across the region. Right now, it still is a severe drought in North Canterbury and for a large part of the year it was in South Canterbury as well. And there was an article, I don't know if many of you saw it, an article in The Listener, four or five months ago? Oh, no. February. Yeah, about February time. Um, which was about the use of different, um, different pasture species and different ways of farming to, as drought proofing. And I, I, it was a great article, and it was really interesting, and I thought it was a message that would be worthwhile for us at Environment Canterbury to hear. And it just happened that two of the people involved in the article were people that I knew, so I could, I could ring them up. And um, we've got here today two people who are going to talk about this in, from different perspectives. First of all, it's Boyd MacDonald from Lone Star Farms. And, um, Boyd is the general manager of Lone Star Farms. Lone Star Farms have got eight properties, I think, around New Zealand, seven in the South Island, um, and uh, Boyd will talk a little bit about, about them as we go. But um, he's talking about the kind of practical end, I guess, of the application of some of the science that Professor Derek Moot from Lincoln University has been involved in for several years, or even several decades. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> um, <laughs> about different pasture species and different ways of farming and um, I've known Derek for many many years and, and uh, I remember when he was doing postdoc in the UK and I was in the UK at the same time and it was on climate change and um, that was more to do with wheat wasn't it but it was it was around climate change and, and a lot of his work has been about adapting to changing climate whether that's through greenhouse gas, climate change, or just climate change and, and climate variability. So, um, Boyd's going to start off by talking a little bit about the operation um, in the, I think you're going to concentrate on the Hakataramia farm. Um, so I should say, Lone Star Farms has got one of its properties is in the Canterbury region, but um, quite a few in the South Island. So drought is a real issue for them. And then, so Boyd's going to talk about that and then Derek's going to carry on and talk about some of the science that he's been involved in and the application of that. So I'll hand on to Boyd. Well, thanks for that, Tim. Can everybody hear me all right? Coming through? Uh, thanks for that, Tim. And yeah, I mean, the drought still, uh, you say, North Canterbury and even um, in the Hacker Valley where we're farming one of our farms, um, just before this last uh, storm that came through, um, I think the soil moisture readers were sitting at 8% and um, they never get much below 7 so um, still still very dry down there. We had a wee bit of a reprieve through April, uh, May, but it's, it's certainly dry again. But, um, but anyway, thanks for the opportunity to come along and hopefully we can raise a few points that uh, may, may cause a bit of discussion anyway, but um, we'll, uh, we'll launch into it. So what I plan to cover is just a little bit about uh, Lone Star, who, who we are and what we do. Um, and as um, Tim alluded to, Cabafay Station um, is a reasonably large property. We've got the Hacker Valley, which is obviously in the Ecan catchment, so uh, that'll be what we sort of focus on, uh, talking about the opportunities and what we're doing there. Um, as I said, as um, Tim said, we've got uh, eight, perhaps nine farms uh, scattered around, around New Zealand, one in the North Island uh, and the rest of them in, in, um, in, um, in the South Island. And um, all owned by one, one gentleman, Tom Sturgis, who's an expat American, but um, shipped out to, New, out to New Zealand and based himself in Nelson in about 1994. Um, yeah, um, nine farms, 140,000 stock units, <coughs> all sheep and beef, and um, um, it um, <coughs> uh, employs about 47 people, which uh, I get 
up. So, um, so what do we do at Lone Star? Um, we grow, harvest, convert and market energy. And um, I guess it's a flash way of saying we grow grass and sell it, but it's, it's a, wee bit more, a wee bit more to it than that. Um, our, um, the, the growth function here we look at is, is our agronomy function, um, where we look at our uh, pasture renovation, our fertiliser plants, and um, those sorts of things. Our harvest function, we sort of, um, that's mostly our stock policies and um, what we can make the most money out of basically the day, and we look at, through farm maps and a few other models, what, what we can do and what's actually going to give us the best return on, on that property and the opportunities around those resources are there. The convert function is really utilisation um, and how we can utilise most of that uh, energy that we grow. And Basically what we're looking at there is um, subdivision and, and stock water and those sorts of things. Marketing is pretty much straight out selling and um, what options we've got around that. And the energy function is, yeah, megajoules of metallizable energy. And it's probably a word you'll hear a wee bit more back from Derek during, during, um, during the day. But um, that's the amount of energy that actually a plant actually produces at the end of the day. So a wee bit more involved than just uh, growing grass and selling it, I guess, at the end of the day. Um, so, yeah, to, just to paint the picture, I mean, I want to talk about Cabify Station and what we've done there. Um, and while we're talking about drought proofing um, without irrigation, um, I do compare our system there to an irrigation system because we have got an opportunity of irrigation and have got some irrigation at Cabify. So Cabify Station in the Hacker Valley, as I say, um, on the true right side of the Hacker Valley um, in the Ecan catchment. Um, it's 5,300 hectares. It's actually nine farms that have been put together uh, into one farm. It's um, 3,800 hectares of that is flat to easy rolling country, so cultivatable. The rainfall varies from the, the valley floor next to the river, it's around that 300, 350 millimetres, and up into the, under the ranges under the Kirkinson where we can get up to 600 millimetres of rain. So um, quite a dry climate. Um, and some parts of the farm obviously drier than others. Very good soils, um, it's just moisture is normally the limiting factor. Um, as I said, we've got 400 hectares of irrigation there uh, currently through pivots, rotor rovers, and K-lines. Have got another an option of another 300 hectares worth of water. We have a consent out of the Waitaki River that um, a group of farmers have got together and formed an irrigation company. And um, out of the thousand litres, um, yeah, we've got enough water to irrigate another 300 hectares um, should we choose to. Running, depending on the season, but roughly about 36,000 stock units, and it can vary anywhere between 20 and 20,000, probably up, has peaked at 60,000 on the odd occasion. Um, and 12 full-time staff, so that, that's Cabify really, um, just an, an introduction. But as I said, it, it is a dry <coughs> climate, and water is often the limiting factor for us. Um, so really, you could argue we're farming water as well as energy, but um, water is what we are really farming at Cabot Bay Station. So what we soon realized, um, I, I started with Lone Star six years ago. So when I came into, the, uh, the rain, uh, into sort of running the operation, and we got a new manager at um, Cabify about the same time or shortly after, um, that we, we had to have water efficient plants. Um, we had to make the most of the water we had and um, we realised that long before the irrigation opportunity came along uh, because then we knew our, our resources for irrigation were going to be limited. So we had a big area of dry land that we had to focus on and try to get the best out of it. So we uh, had, I'd had, or both of the, the manager and myself had both had previous experience with Derek over a number of years and um, we knew what the, the potential of the lucerne plant was. Um, the soil types and the environment at Cabify was certainly, um, was certainly in the line to, uh, to, um, for lucerne to flourish. So you can ask why, why we chose lucerne and what the attributes of that plant are. Um, and Derek will probably go into more of the science of this later on, but lucerne is a very efficient um, converter of water to energy. Typically, a lucerne plant will, uh, for every millimetre of water it gets, will produce somewhere between 20 to 24 kilograms of dry matter. Now, when you compare that to a ryegrass or a ryegrass clover uh, sward, 
Um, a ryegrass clover, um, we typically around 10 to 12 marks. So you could argue lucerne is twice as efficient um, as, a, as a ryegrass system. But not only that, the lucerne plant has a, a deep tap root, as you're probably all well aware. Um, and um, you know, it'll easily go down to three metres in our country and deeper. Um, and you know, what that enables us is to use the full, full soil profile to extract moisture and minerals from. So when you've got a lucerne plant that's getting its feet down three metres compared to a, a, a ryegrass plant that's probably only getting it down 100 to 150 millimetres, Derek, I'm, I'm picking, um, you've got a lot more of the soil profile you can actually extract moisture and everything else from. Um, the other point on lucerne is it's very high quality. Um, when we talk, I talk about megajoules and metabolites or energy, they're higher in a lucerne plant than they are in a ryegrass plant. So not only are we going to increase production, we're also, also going to increase quality. So um, I guess it was a win-win a situation. So when, when uh, I arrived at Cabify, it was predominantly a ryegrass clover type system. Um, although you could argue it was more of a rye clover slash brown top type system because the rye grass plants were struggling with the dry and it always used to re sort of revert back to brown top. Now that country was typically growing somewhere between four and five tonne of dry matter a year. Um, and um, we, we, we looked at Lucerne and believed we could probably grow seven tonne of dry matter, um, average over a 10 year period. So when we looked, uh, and then for us, when we're making these sort of decisions, it all comes down to what the return on investment is going to be. So we took our old pasture um, and uh, we've measured this now for, um, for close on six years and it's probably <coughs> averaging four and a half if, ton over that period of time. This country that we were looking at doing this program on was some reasonable soils and we believe it's grown close to five ton. Um, and um, if we're converting 75% of that and getting 15 cents for every kilogram of dry matter we, we produce, um, that's the sort of income we're getting per hectare. Now, I would argue on a brown top ryegrass type system, on a traditional system like was being run at Cabify, um, 15 cents would be very generous, and it's probably near a 12 to 13 cents. We budgeted on our um, new Lucerne um, system, um, as I said, going about seven ton, our average over a 10 year period. Uh, again, utilizing 75%, and we've up the cents per kilogram dry matter because we can actually run more profitable systems. We can actually finish lambs, um, we can sell feed to dairy farmers, um, we can do a whole lot of stuff that actually increases, as I say, that quality thing, increases what that dry matter is worth. So you can see there, just on those figures, and to be fair, that figure there, although we've only been going five, six years, uh, is very conservative. Um, until the years previous to this one, we'd had some real bumpers, and we're, we have measured 12 to 14 tonne off this area on, with this lucerne. Um, lucerne, and more commonly with us, is it, we, we sow grass with it, so it's a lucerne copsfoot or a lucerne fescue mix. We have got straight lucerne as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that figure there is conservative, but we're only part way through the program and um, we're unsure how long the lucerne will last, but the way it's going at the moment, we're confident we will get up to our 10 years, so um, that could be conservative. Anyway, an extra $400 a hectare for doing, not doing a lot. When you're growing, um, growing that much more feed, there's obviously some extra costs that, um, that are going to be associated with that just by growing more energy. So allowing for extra fertiliser and lime, uh, and allowing for a winter spray, which uh, is needed probably every second or third year on the straight lucerne swords, although as I said, we're going to a grass mix with our lucerne, so we don't, actually, we don't do a lot of spraying, um, but the average person would if they're on a, a lucerne only type system. Um, and obviously we need a bit of extra labour because we're, we're producing a whole lot more of that country. But basically we're looking at an extra $100 a hectare in cost um, in, um, on, that, on that area. So we're getting about a 35% return. And as I said, we believe we're probably getting closer to a 50% return uh, because we are producing a lot more than what we thought we were going to. Uh, we have a full-time technician um, across our three of our southern farms and they do pasture cuts and also back calculate what we must be growing on, what we're feeding. So um, we've got a lot of data to, to, to back these sort of numbers up uh, at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, we're going to 35% return, so a bit of a no-brainer. And um, as I say, that's what we got on with. And, um, and um, 
yeah, reaping, reaping the rewards here. But as I said, we've got an irrigation opportunity, and this is where it's probably uh, picked up in the um, in the listener article. We've got an irrigation opportunity on this farm. Um, 300 hectares worth of water out of the Waitaki River. And being the ECAM people, you'll realise the uh, the Waitaki water is pretty much 100% reliable. So um, quite a big prize there for us. Um, so we also had to look at um, what we could do with that irrigation water versus our irrigation system. <coughs> I mean, versus our dry land um, lucerne system. Just to paint the picture on the uh, the lucerne, uh, I mean the irrigation opportunity, as I say, 300 hectares of water out of the Waitaki River. Um, on farm and off farm costs about 11,000 a hectare um, to get the water onto the ground. Now that's compared to a lot of schemes that have been buried around it, it's probably pretty reasonable um, at the end of the day. Um, that's it's fully, fully developed, fully fenced, fully watered, about 11,000 a hectare. Um, so 3.3 million to do the, um, do the um, 300 hectares. Um, we budget on that area growing 15 tonne of dry matter. Now, Derek will probably tell me I'm dreaming, and he's probably right. Um, with our existing irrigation that's there the, under the centre pivots, in a very, very good season, we may get up to 14, but we would budget on growing 12, and uh, 12 is probably a more accurate figure. Uh, the Hacker Valley sits about 300 metres above sea level, so it's not a, not a long growing season. Uh, it also gets very hot <coughs> in the summer, and a lot of you will probably realise that ryegrass, clover, pastures pretty much shut down, or certainly slow up markedly once your soil temperature get over 20 degrees, uh, where our loosened fescue keeps growing. Uh, so another plus plus for the Lucerne, Lucerne plant. But um, budget only growing 15 tonne as against the 7 tonne Lucerne uh, um, system. We break even. In fact, we actually slightly go backwards with the capital cost. As I said, um, here, here's your area, could irrigate 300 hectares. If it grew 15 tonne, we utilise 80%, which is just allowing for what we're told we've developed the fencing would be probably a little bit better. Um, Budgeting on a 25 cents per kilogram dry matter, which is pushing it right out there. I mean, I tried to make these figures look as good as I could, but 25 cents, you'd have to be wintering some dairy cows and doing things pretty sharp to get that on an average return. Um, as against, oh, sorry, as against a, um, a lucerne system that would argue is producing, I mean, performing better than this, and it has done over the last uh, last five years, with the last one being dry. We're, the last year has still been dry, we still grow over seven tonne of dry matter off that Lucerne area um, this, this last year. Um, as I say, breaking even. Um, so sometimes, I mean, the number's going to be different on every farm, but sometimes irrigation is not, not the only option and not the only answer. So um, this one here, that's what we found. Um, so why do people do it? You could argue, I guess. Uh, well, that would be a logical question come up. But if we uh, if we base compared our uh, the new irrigation potential here that we've seen as against what we were doing previous to a lucerne system, uh, we've got a 7.3 percent return. Um, oh, sorry, on here, which is totally unrealistic, I've got a 20 cent return on that dry land system. It's probably more likely going to be 12 and not very reliable. But we push push that return up over 10 percent. So you can see why, why some people say, well, shit, I can get 10% return on my irrigation, I'm going to get increasing capital value, it, it's, it's worth a go. But um, to be fair, I think we need to compare it to a uh, system where we're extracting the maximum out of, a, of, of the resources we've got. And, um, I would argue in a dry land environment, it's certainly not a traditional ryegrass um, type pasture system. So, so basically, in summary, um, we can make this number say whatever we like. Um, farms are pretty good at that because we've got to go and talk to bankers pretty regularly and it can be pretty interesting. So um, we can certainly make the numbers say whatever we like. But um, I just want to leave you the, yeah, the message that really a lucerne based system can be com um, you know, profitable and um, compared to an irrigation opportunity. Um, as an, and I will stress the numbers will be different on every farm um, and every different irrigation system. You might argue we may have been able to make this work if we went to Deering. Um, we actually did those numbers. Up there today. We did the numbers three years ago on the opportunity that water to convert to deering. 
we would we needed a six dollar fifty to six dollar seventy payout to break even. Now uh, we would have been smiling the first year because I think we got, they got eight dollars forty, but uh, we would have been talking to our bankers this year. So um, yeah, uh, certainly um, certainly we need to really push the limits with the dairy system, really intensify things, and you're probably all well aware what what environmental factors that can have. Um, so yeah, Lucerne and why Lucerne? Basically because it's it's great at converting um, water to energy and it um, uses a whole soil profile and um, of water and minerals and it fixes its own nitrogen which it can use for itself and uh, its companion plants. And to be honest it uses a whole lot less capital than the, um, than the irrigation system. So. Well you want to kick in Derek, you want to take some questions now? Tell me, how do you do? I think we'll, we'll carry on and take questions at <coughs> the end. So Boyd's place is where the rubber hits the road. I'm just a theorist. So I'm going to give you a couple of theory questions to start with. And the first theory question, if you want more information, it's actually at this website. So um, I'll put this presentation on, and you've got it being videoed, but I'll also put it up at, which is just the Lincoln University website slash dryland. And any presentation I do, I put up there. All our publications, etc., will go up on, on that website. So that's really the only thing you need. I want you to imagine that that's your farm in the middle of February. Okay, and you're farming somewhere on the east coast of New Zealand, and you've got between 300 and 800 millimetres of rainfall. That's what your farm looks like. And the predictions are, that's a, a shot in Canterbury, that by 2030 things are going to be drier for you. So that's where you were 15 or 20 years ago, and that's your farm. So now you have a choice. I'm going to give you a choice, and you have to take one of these choices. All right? Now this is a, an interactive seminar, so you have to choose, you can't sit there passively. I'm going to give you all the water that you want, which is Boyd's irrigation system, or I'm going to give you all the nitrogen that you want, but you can't have both, because you're not allowed to be greedy. You can either have ice cream or cake, but you can't have both. So I'll give you all the water you want, or all the nitrogen you want, okay? That's what your farm looks like, that one or that one. And you get to choose. Right, who wants the water? Hands up. Okay, you all want the water. Who wants the nitrogen? Good on you, that you're right. Take the nitrogen, you'll do better. And now I'll explain why. Because that was what was facing farmers 20 years ago who were thinking about converting on the Canterbury Plains. That's the choice that they had. So I did a very simple experiment. I took a dry land pasture at Lincoln University and I um, gave it all of the water it could possibly want, all of the nitrogen it could possibly want, or nothing, or all of the water and all of the nitrogen that it could possibly want, to see just what would it grow. Now please don't tell ECAN about this because we use more nitrogen than we should have, but, but bear with me. Okay, So this is what we did. That's that pasture that Boyd was talking about that he's got as a dry land pasture that's not growing very much. He said in his environment he might get about four ton. This is 6.3, that's about what a dry land farm on the Canterbury Plains or um, on the hills is growing traditionally. That's what they're producing. Those of you that took the water, you just spent, what, $10,000 a hectare? You spent $10,000 a hectare to take all of the water that was available to you and sorry, you didn't get your 15 tonnes. You went from 6.3 to 9.8 tonnes. That is a fully irrigated pasture on the Canterbury Plains. That's what we got, 10 tonnes of dry matter. So that's four tonnes extra. That's not gonna pay for your $10,000 a hectare. Those of you that took the nitrogen, you got 16 tonnes of dry matter. I didn't give you any water. So this is the potential from that 6.3 tonnes of just adding nitrogen to the system. I could go to 15.7 tonnes of dry matter. If I add them both, I go to 22 tonnes of dry matter. If I put all the water and all the nitrogen. So what's the first thing that happened when we converted hundreds of thousands of hectares or 100,000 hectares of dry land sheep farming into irrigated dairy farming on the Canterbury Plains? They put on all the water they could possibly want, 
They didn't really improve their pasture profile. What do you do? Find out what's limiting. What's limiting? Nitrogen. Let's add nitrogen. And that's what we've done. That's the Canterbury farming <coughs> system. That's what we've done. Now, because I don't do curves very well, what we do is we look at this one and we go, well, that pasture there had all the nitrogen it needed and it had all the water it needed. So what's the only thing that would have made it curvy like this? Temperature. 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 You're not supposed to let the guest answer the questions. <laughs> You're supposed to get in before them. So temperature is the only thing that would make that different. So I can count for temperature. I can take that temperature response. And what I do is just calculate, instead of on a daily basis, a temperature basis. So I accumulate the temperature and go, how much pasture did I grow? And just accumulate the temperature. So instead of having days down here, I accumulate the thermal time or the temperature time. And this is my pasture. This is those of you that chose your $10,000 a hectare irrigation scheme. You grew on a straight line, 3.3 kilograms of dry matter per hectare, per temperature unit that you got. Now Boyd doesn't get as many temperature units as I get because he's in the Hacker Valley and I'm at Lincoln. So I'm a bit warmer, my value is going to be a bit higher than his because he's going to shut off and not have as many temperature units. That's my 22 tonnes of dry matter. So that's that curve now put into a straight line. I'm growing 7 kilos of dry matter per hectare per degree C day, per temperature unit, per thermal unit. That's the nitrogen gap. That's what the farmers experienced when they converted and put water on. This is the potential for their farm, and this is what they actually got when they first did their conversions. Now, how much nitrogen do I need to get 22 tonnes of dry matter? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Ryegrass is a fairly simple plant. It adjusts its leaf size to try and maintain about three, between three and three and a half percent nitrogen because at about that level it photosynthesizes at its maximum rate. So it doesn't want to have big leaves that are very nitrogen deficient because the photosynthesis rate drops. So it adjusts at leaf size. So you go out and you measure your pasture, it's 3.5% in. What's going on here? Well, it's because the leaf size has changed. So let's just do the maths very easily. If I've got 20 tonnes of dry matter and I need 3% nitrogen, how many kilos of nitrogen do I need? Are they all policy people? <laughs> Can't do maths. How much? How many kilos of in? Well, let's, let's do it. 20,000 kilos of dry matter. 20,000, that's two, zero, 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 zero. <laughs> okay, a whack off a zero, that gives me 2,000, that's 10%. Whack off another zero, that's 200. Okay, that's 1% and I need 3%. You can do that part for me, can't you? I need 600 kilos of nitrogen. Okay, I need 600 kilos of nitrogen to fully grow that 22 tonnes of dry matter. 600 kilos of N. Anybody know what the restrictions are on a ryegrass pasture, supposedly? Recommendations? Recommended 200 kilos of N on a dairy farm on Can in Canterbury? It's not enough. Not enough. We're over irrigating and under nitrogen fertilizing. Bizarre situation. Farmers work it out fairly easily. Um, I keep putting nitrogen on, I keep growing more pasture. 600 kilos, that's 1.2 tons per hectare of urea. That's what's actually required to fully nitrogen fertilize a ryegrass pasture on the Canterbury Plains. That's what we need. It's pretty straightforward. If you get one of these, you need some of this, and then you grow this. And that's what we've done. And we now have about 1.3 million dairy cows on the Canterbury Plains, and boy, it's poor old sheep and beef are being disappearing and becoming scarce. They're almost like the mower. They're almost gone, but not quite. And that's what's happening. And guess what happened to our nitrogen fertilizer use in this country? That's what happened to our nitrogen fertiliser use, and then they stopped letting the figures be available to us to easily find in about 2007. But that's what happened. So that's what we did for 20 years. And actually, we've still got nitrogen deficient pastures. All our <laughs> pastures when you drive around the Canterbury Plains are nitrogen deficient. How do I know that? Because colloquially, excuse me, um, 
here, that's a piss patch. That's a urine patch from a dairy cow. Okay? That has a thousand kilos of nitrogen. This is fully irrigated. Look at it, it's yellow. It's anemic. It's nitrogen deficient. But I keep pouring the water on because it'll grow more. Well, actually, it won't. What it's short of is nitrogen. And most of our pastures, all our grass, is nitrogen deficient all of the time. That's just reality. It's a grass. So that's the dairy situation. And is it surprising that when we've done that, and I've got a thousand kilos of N here, because that's what I deposit in a urine patch, I can't use all that N. There's too much for that pasture there. So the problem, and the reason we have nitrate leaching, is because we have a thousand kilos or 800 kilos of N deposited in one small area. It's not how much N fertilizer I use across here. Because if I put in fertilizer on here, the plants can use it. The problem is, when I deposit a thousand kilos of N in one very small patch, the plants can't use that much nitrogen. They just can't. And that's the issue, and that's why we have a nitrate leaching problem. But what do we do? We actually put most of these dairy farms onto some of the shallower soils we have on the plains that have the lowest water holding capacity because it's good to stand dairy cows on shallow soils in the winter because then they don't end up up to their middle in mud. So that's what we did. And that's the regional annual nitrate losses that have occurred since 1990 and everybody else is pretty stable and we just continue on increasing and increasing our nitrate leaching. It's due to the urine patch produced by a dairy cow. That's what produces nitrate leaching. So, I don't work with dairy farmers, I just thought I'd give you the background for why that happens. Okay? I'm the only person in the country that works with sheep and beef farmers. Everybody else works in the dairy industry because they got lots of money. That's actually the sort of pasture that, f that animals would like to eat. A high va feeding value pasture has a whole lot of legume, lots of leaf, not much stem, and it's quite young herbage. And if you give them a choice, cows and sheep would prefer to eat 70% legumes and 30% grass. Our dairy farms give them 100% ryegrass. We basically give them what they don't want to eat, so eat it. But that's actually what they prefer to eat. So if I do get a little bit of clover grows in my dairy pasture, what's the first thing they eat when they walk in the paddock? You know, there's the broccoli, there's the ice cream kids. What are you going to eat when you walk in? They eat the legume. That's what they take. That's what they target. That's what disappears from the system. I like my nitrogen to come fixed from the atmosphere. Sheep and beef farmers don't tend to have deep pockets. So we try and grow legumes. A, because they're efficient fixers of nitrogen. I'm not having to import urea. I'm fixing it from the atmosphere. And B, because actually that's what animals would prefer to eat. They prefer to eat legumes. So that's why my research and the team I work with is predominantly around dealing with legumes and finding appropriate legumes to grow in dryland pasture areas. So what happens in the summer? So this is that pasture that I showed you before from the experiment in the middle of summer. And in this case it's a coxfoot pasture and you can see it's just sort of surviving. In these temperatures the ryegrass would have died, um, but the, the coxfoot's hung around. Here's my 22 tonnes from my 7 kilos of dry matter per hectare per degree C day. This is what happens to my dry land pasture. Those of you that chose nitrogen, this is your pasture. Okay? Your pasture grew as fast as this heavily fertilised pasture in the spring period until it ran out of water. Nobody told the plants they were going to run out of water. So they just grew as fast as they possibly could given the temperature and nitrogen and moisture that they had. And then they ran out of water. And that's what happens when you've got no water. So this year, my farm at Lincoln, we actually ran out here, and we were dry all the way through to here. And then we would have got a little bit of production, so we'd have got done about 12 tonnes of dry matter. So the duration of the drought, the summer dry period, actually dictates how much we grow. Once we relieved that with some, mo some moisture, we grew... You know, that line's parallel. We grew as fast here as we did here. What's limiting pasture production? Nitrogen. What's limiting plant growth? Nitrogen. Why are there 7.5 
maybe six billion people on the planet because we learned how to create urea. If we didn't have urea, we wouldn't have people. Pretty much, we, didn't, we wouldn't be growing wheat, we wouldn't be growing any of the plants that actually allow us to have an increased population. So nitrogen is not the enemy. Nitrogen in the wrong place is the enemy. But Boyd Farms water, well, this is the water deficit that occurs. So this is starting off here at field capacity. This is the plants using the water through the season and it gets very dry and then we get some rainfall. See the rainfall? And it gets dry again for a bit and then we get some more rainfall and by the end of the season we've filled the profile again. This is the dry land pasture that had plenty of nitrogen and grew 15 tonnes of dry matter. And this is the dry land pasture that had no nitrogen and grew 6 tonnes of dry matter. Their pattern of water extraction is exactly the same. It's just one of them is not using the, not the water very efficiently because it is deficient in nitrogen. So the physics of evapotranspiration means it doesn't matter if I'm a fully fertilised nitrogen fed pasture or I'm a nitrogen deficient pasture, the physics means evapotranspiration will occur at the same rate. If you look at the MET service and it says there's a 5 mil evapotranspiration rate today, it doesn't say that's for a pine forest and the pasture without nitrogen is 3. It's the same. If the herbage is covering the ground and the plant is actively growing, the rate at which we lose soil moisture is the same. Therefore, if I'm in a moisture restricted environment, I want to use this moisture as efficiently as I possibly can. How do I do that? Well, in the spring, this is a, a pure grass doing as well as it possibly could. And with the 200 millimetres of water or rainfall that might be in that bucket of water that it has at the beginning of the spring, it produced about three tonnes of dry matter. This is what we expect a ryegrass white clover dairy farm to do. So if I come to ECAM and I'm doing my conversions, that's the efficiency value that people would expect me to have for my ryegrass white clover pasture, 20 kilos of dry matter per millimetre of water that I grow. And my lucerne does closer to 30, because my, my lucerne is never nitrogen deficient. So it's never restricted for photosynthesis, it's never restricted for leaf area, and it's always maximising the water that it's got. Straight water use efficiency, that's the same bucket essentially, a 200 mil bucket. This is a pretty powerful graph if you're talking to a dry land farmer who's doing this and producing about two and a half tonnes of dry matter in spring. And then you go, well you could actually produce six and a half. And that's what Boyd showed you earlier when he said, you know, maybe my horrible pastures were doing about four and now they're doing seven. Now they're doing eight. Okay, so that's the reality of not just the pasture, it's the same bucket of water, but I'm producing twice as much feed. How do we do that? Well, we do that with some different plants. This is one, Boyd's talked about lucerne, this is subterranean clover. Um, it's an annual legume, it fixes nitrogen, and it grows early in the spring, and you can see this is sub versus white over a two year period. Um, lots of production here, the growth rate, 60 kilos of dry matter per hectare per day in early spring. So subterranean clover, which is an annual legume, avoids the drought. It dies. It says, I'll grow as much as I can through the spring, and then I'm going to die. And I'm going to avoid the drought by dying. But it's given us very good early spring production of high metabolizable energy, high protein, and good quality feed for lactating ewes or cows. So it's very palatable legume. Um, in a wet season, we've got a bump here with the white clover because it will respond but nothing from my sub because the sub has died. It's an annual species. It's a winter annual, which means it germinates and grows from the autumn through to the spring, and then it dies and avoids the, the summer period. So that's one of the systems that we've implemented for um, farmers in East Coast dryland areas. This is an example of it. Um, Will Gregg's property at Meadowbank in Marlborough, and these are some slides from his presentation. That's what it looked like. That's what it looks like when you put some fertilizer on it and some lime on it and added in some legume. And these are the little legumes, the little sub clover plants starting to germinate in that spring period. So using that same principle and saying, well, what plant actually grows in your environment? In this case, it was an annual clover. So Marlborough, very dry, um, very dry. So for a farmer in this environment, what you're trying to do 
have your lambing as early as possible without getting hit by too many snowstorms so that you can quickly grow animals through September, October, November and maybe part of December but you've got three months essentially to grow animals as fast as you possibly can and you actually want them off by the sort of third week of November so that if they're lambs they're heavy enough to meet the Christmas um, export market into the UK. So you've got about three months. The easiest and fastest way to grow animals is if, if mum's lactating well and the lambs are feeding well. That's when you'll get your fastest growth rates. So this plant is providing very good lactation feed and converting that water into a feed very efficiently because it's a legume. Um, their numbers, just I won't go into them in great detail, but for from 2005 to 2012, his ewe efficiency has increased 40%, and his return here, $1,910 per hectare, so a 260% uh, percent return on changing his farm system from the traditional pastures that he had growing in his dryland context to being a very legume dominant pasture. Lucerne, Boyd's already mentioned Lucerne, this is the plant I spent um, most of my research career working with. I came back from the UK as Tim indicated and went, well who are the most vulnerable farmers in New Zealand if climate change actually happens? And that was about 20 years ago and I said East Coast dryland farmers because they're already coping with huge variability. I don't need to have a conversation with them about where the climate change is occurring, that's 20 years ago. They don't want to know. It's not even in the conversation to be had. Let's just go, you've got a variable climate. Some years it's wet, some years it's dry. How do we create a resilient system for you? Well, we can use a plant like this. This one um, was eight months old, and that was the root that it had produced. It sort of, if you look carefully, it sort of crinkles a wee bit here. It was on a gravelly riverbed, so it made its way down through the gravel to get down there. And it's about one and a half metres in, in length after that eight month period. We can direct drill it here into pasture that's been sprayed off with with conserved um, moisture here, and we've done about 60,000 hectares of dryland pastures converted into lucerne pastures um, over the last decade. And, and Boyd was at the upper end here. I don't calculate the financials. These are the numbers that people give me. 28 to 35% internal rate of return on investment. What that means is you can go to the bank and ask to borrow money up to 35% and you'll still be making money. Okay, that's what an internal rate of investment means for those of you that don't work in that area. Well, that's how it's been explained to me. The only people that generally are doing this um, at some point usually end up in jail. Because most of the others can't do that. Um, case study, this is the one that was highlighted in the, in the listener article, Doug Avery's property. I met Doug at a seminar I was giving in about 1998, maybe about 2000. Um, and he attended a seminar simply like this and I was explaining the virtues of Lucerne and he went away and started to, to implement what we had, what we talked about. And about five years later I met him again, um, he'd run into my mother-in-law in Blenheim. And so um, she said, what are, you, what are the girls doing? Oh, one of them is married to this guy in, in, at Lincoln called Derek Moot. Oh, Derek Moot, he saved my life. Well, I'm not quite sure that that's true, but that's his story. Um, and that's the way he tells it. But this is what he was farming with. That's what his hills look like, overgrazed, not a great advertisement with State Highway 1 running next to you. Now, for those of you that don't really know um, Melbourne all that well, you, know, you might know where the salt works are. Doug farms right next to the salt works. So it's his property that's right next to the salt works. You put the salt works in the area that's got the highest evapotranspiration and highest wind run that you can have in the country. And that's where the salt works are. So we've re he's redesigned his property, it's now a lucerne property. Some of these um, hillsides that weren't doing so well have salt bush. We use chemical fallow to control the moisture and use the moisture when we want to. And we've sort of planted it in the deep areas so that we put it in the valleys and we leave these hills. I don't want a tractor going over this area. Um, so, but this also, oops, this also allows um, the animals to go and get their 70% legume, 30% grass if they want to. They can graze in here, there's no fence here. This is just the animals can go and eat where they want to um, in that landscape. For him, 149% um, gross trading profit, so from $317 a hectare to $792 a hectare. From a land performance perspective, from an animal performance perspective, this is the line that makes the most sense. Um, 
he's gone from producing 38,000 kilos of uh, lamb sold to 74,000 kilos of lamb sold. So a 90, almost 100% increase in the amount of lamb that he is selling <laughs> off that property. What's happened since 2012 is he's bought the neighbour. I mean, you get a better system than someone else, you buy them out. So it's a bit hard to put the comparisons up beyond that point because he's, the farm's obviously gotten bigger. This is what his farm looks like in the spring. Um, these are lambs that have probably been growing about, some of them probably up to a half a kilo a day. So think about that, okay? How much ice cream are you going to have to eat to put on a half a kilo a day? For some of you, not so much, but for others, quite a bit. So that's what they're growing at from um, birth to weaning. And at weaning, if you can get rid of them at weaning, then you can go bang on the ship, gone, and they're off the farm, which means there's more feed for every other animal. Each one you can get rid of at weaning means you have fewer animals and therefore more feed for each of them and your system ratchets up. If you've got to keep them there and they're all struggling for pasture, then your system ratchets down. And that was the trough that he was in. Um, this, is the, this is Doug and his wife Wendy and Fraser's come back on the farm. With better income we can focus on the environment and preserve it for generations to come. From a farmer who was actually leaving the, the farm and essentially um, suicidal. And he's doing a talk at the moment, he's doing a, a talk, um, a mental health talk, because there's a lot of farmers in a fairly depressed situation at the moment, so he's travelling the country talking about being resilient um, farmers. We introduced the same system in the high country, um, same sort of landscape farming occurring here. This is Bogroy Station, which is probably at the moment, this will be under a foot of snow or more. Um, but again, the same principle where we've got deeper soil, we've put the lucerne, here we've left the native vegetation, the Madagari, some ecosystem services being provided here. This is quite good shelter for merino lambs. Um, the problem with the merino ewe is she can't count. So she has one, and then she has two, and she gets up and walk away, and she doesn't even realise she's had a lamb. So she just gets up and goes, uh, whereas here, she'll actually get up and go and have a feed, and she might come back here, and there's a chance that the lamb will actually mother up with her. They're not the best mothers around the merino sheep. Um, just to finish, one of the issues that we have in this environment in the high country is we have a real problem with exchangeable aluminium. So can we take the same principle and apply it to other plants? And um, this is one that's just starting to get a little bit of uh, press, is we've been using Russell Lupin. So if we have no lime and we have a very high aluminium concentration, exchangeable aluminium here, because of a low pH, we actually find that deep tap root of lucerne, instead of going down, goes sideways. It's very, um, uh, very intolerant of the aluminium in the subsoil, and most legumes are. But Russell lupins actually tolerate that aluminium, and so we've been working on a system in some of the farms <coughs> here to try and have Russell lupins introduced into the system. Again, a nitrogen fixing plant um, that's causing some issues in other parts of the so maybe to some of you. Um, transforming dryland regions. And our, I, I, I didn't put any photos up, but our plots are at Glenmore Station. Um, Glenmore Station, without being able to sow anything at the moment, he's, he would go bankrupt, pretty much. Um, so transforming dryland regions, they're profitable, resilient, and legume-based. The weakness, uh, the farmers need new skills. They're managing different plants. We don't really have a high political profile. It's not a huge lobby of people going out and lobbying for an irrigation scheme. Um, we've got about two million hectares as an opportunity cost to work with. We have some issues. The dairy industry are powerful, and overseer says we leak too much nitrogen. Um, so we've actually now got farmers who are not planting lucerne and are planting ryegrass and using urea because of the numbers that come out of the overseer model. So there's some work to be done on overseer, which is inaccurately um, estimating the nitrogen leaching out of the lucent system. Sustainable transformations to allow this to happen. When I talk, you have incremental change, which is a small change on a farm, a little bit of production change. These are transformational changes. So basically changing the farm system from a dryland pasture to a lucent system is the equivalent of changing from a dryland pasture to a dairy system. It's a transformation and a major transformation that's occurring. So farmers with incentives to change, they've got to be economic, land sustainability and social. Appropriate research with some on-farm application. It's our job to reduce the complexity. Whenever you change a system, it will be more complex. 
it requires intensification, it requires new skills. It's the scientist's job to understand that and try and make that as simple as possible to the farmer. Um, and then you have to develop mutual integrity and trust because farmers don't believe most of what scientists say. So it takes time to get that point of being able to have um, mutual integrity and trust with the farmers and have them actually adopt what they say. That's it. Happy to take questions. Thanks, Derek. And Lloyd, thank you. If people have got questions, we'll, we'll run questions for a while and then um, we'll wrap up. Yeah, the cost of, uh, well, Derek, I mean, our, our cost is normally somewhere between eight and $900 a hectare, but that, that's a full cost, and it's probably not doing the Lucerne system justice because to put ryegrass in, um, it wouldn't be a lot different. Okay, we probably need a little bit more lime because it likes a higher pH, um, um, and that's probably only the really additional cost. I mean, seed cost cultivation, we, we're direct drilling everything, so same cost, it's probably just a bit of extra lime, so if you compared it, compared it to um, putting a ryegrass system in, not a lot, probably a little, a little bit more lime, but um, roughly eight to nine hundred dollars a hectare is what it's costing us, fully costed. Can I just jump in there, because I was going to ask the question which follows on from that. You mentioned that I don't think you've replaced your lucerne at all in the time that it's been in. How long would you expect, and this is kind of for both of you, how long would you expect lucerne to last? And how does that compare to other pastures? Um, lucerne had, a, I mean, there was a lot of lucerne around back in the, in the 60s and 70s, Tim, as you know, and um, you know, it had a few disease problems and, and went out of favour. Um, and, um, you know, so it wasn't lasting back there, so everybody got out of it and did something else, and now we're coming back into it. We're budgeting on a lasting seven years um, as a straight sward. Um, now, some of our earlier stuff and the previous company I was with would be that age now, um, plus. Um, thanks to science and thanks to people like Derek, we understand the plant a lot more. We know how actually how to manage it, and I think now that we're managing it correctly, it'll last a lot longer. The key to it is to let it flower in the autumn, so it actually builds up back up as root reserves and is really vibrant and ready to go in that following spring. Um, look, I mean, we don't know, but I. I think we're going to be pleasantly surprised how long it does last. How does that compare to other pasture species? Well, like our ryegrass and the cabbage fire and that dry environment lasting three to four years. So it depends on where you are. Um, I can kill a lucerne stand in two years if I over irrigate it, but if I'm in um, Manitoto, there are stands there that are 30 years old. So there's a, an environment by management interaction, but um, I tend to tell people to budget on seven years so that they are pleasantly surprised. If I tell them to do 10 and they only get seven, then they're angry with me. Whereas let's say seven and they get 10, they're happy. It's just easy psychology. Tom? Is, there, is there any difference between good impact in the Lucerne and ryegrass? Uh, is there a difference in the urine patch? No, there isn't. Okay, so a urine patch coming out of either, um, in fact, the difference is the animal that has been grazing. So. A urine, essentially that there is a mismatch between what a plant needs to grow efficiently and maximise its growth and what an animal needs. Animals need about 18% crude protein. If we take the nitrogen content of a pasture, we multiply by 6.25 and we get about, um, we, we get the crude protein. About 4% nitrogen is what that urine patch will look like. A lot of pastures are about 4, they're more than the 3 that I talked about. So they're 25% crude protein. The animal needs 18 so the animal has to get rid of the excess protein and there is a, an energy cost for the animal to do that, but it then concentrates up that nitrogen and that's why it's urinated out. The larger the animal, the more that nitrogen concentration, the patch will be higher and also the feed they've been eating. The, uh, so the difference is that dairy cows tend to deposit a large amount and it's a, it's a big volume in, in a, uh, one area, whereas sheep tend to be much more patch um, urinators and um, the other thing is that if you have a plant like, like lucerne it switches off its nitrogen fixation in the presence of that high soil end 
and actually uses that soil nitrogen rather than fixing nitrogen. If I'm a plant and I'm fixing nitrogen, there's actually a cost to me to do that. It costs about 15% of my carbon that I've made from photosynthesis. So rather than do that, I'll use the nitrogen that's in the soil. So we don't tend to see urine patch responses in um, lucerne stands because they're not nitrogen deficient and they're taking it up. The other thing is, because we're not fully irrigating, the nitrogen stays in the soil. So once Boyd takes a, a, a lucerne stand out, he might be able to grow a crop of wheat or barley or something else that will then use that soil nitrogen. That's a different scenario from a fully irrigated pasture that then has a winter rainfall event coming through it. He's looking for the winter to recharge his two to three metres of topsoil. We don't usually get it fully recharged through the winter. So the potential for drainage and leaching in that environment is less than it is in a shallow soil with a, a urine patch from a dairy cow. Just, just to add to that, I mean, uh, it's probably a little bit of a frustration that we, uh, we we're finding probably with overseer too, is in, in an environment like the Hacker Valley, um, there's very, very little uh, leaching that goes down through the soil profile. Um, and, you know, we often get uh, a question about the amount of phosphate and anything else that ends up in the waterways. Um, it, it, it travels across across the country, not th down through the country. It's, it's bare land, wind, erosion, which is shifting that stuff, we believe, into the waterways. It's not actually leaching down through the profile, because as Derek says, we don't get enough rain to do it. Yes. Yeah, I just want to raise a sort of a variability in hydrology and plant related questions. I've noticed that a lot of the information presented has been in the term of averages, and we know that East Coast hydrology is highly variable. We have long periods of dry periods, and then we have rain, we might have dry years. I mean, in Chevy, it's quite dry at the moment. I don't know if it's a drought or not, it may not be a drought in East Coast terms. But what that means is, in averages, you hide a lot of that variability, and you hide periods where there may be failure of business. Uh, and the other aspect of it was every now and again you get very large floods and in the United States they've just realised they've got a problem. They can do all the loads of agriculture they like in phosphorus in the soils. But if you have a humongous uh, rainstorm, it all gets washed into the Great Lakes and everything turns green. So I think that's the, that's the threat, you know, this assumption that everything's okay because on average, or on the rain, yeah, you haven't got things moving. But in the wet year, you haven't got things moving. So really my point is, are these systems long-term records or uh, simulated long-term records to pick out the drier and the wetter periods which are going to cause the plant droughts? No, they're not, because they're not being used in dairy systems. And the only people that are doing modelling, the only research money that's available, is generally related to dairy farming. Um, we, to, to deal with the, the excess moisture events, um, there are times when we will fully recharge the moisture. I absolutely agree with that, so, so that will happen. Um, what we're trying to do is cope with that variability. So cope with the very dry year and cope with the very wet year and be sympathetic in the process as we're doing it. If, we, if these were still ryegrass-based systems, we'd have more of a problem than we've got in the, in the lucerne-based system that we have. So the same issues would arise, but they would arise more frequently because the soil profile wouldn't be as dry. So how we deal with um, the one-off major flood events such as we've just seen in the, um, the Whanganui region, I don't know. That is always going to cause soil erosion. It's always going to put phosphorus into the waterways. So we either stop farming and, and, and don't do anything, or we try and come up with some systems that might actually work for most of the time. But how we deal with catastrophic events such as that, I, I don't know. So um, chicory and plantain have a lot more profile in the North Island than they do down here in the South Island. They're also deep tap-rooted species. They don't fix nitrogen, so you still need to have nitrogen supplied to them. They'll do the same things in, in terms of soil uh, moisture, but they won't extract to as deep. So they're shallower rooted, even though they're considered deep tap-rooting species. And they don't grow as much feed in a year as a lucerne plant will. So the first experiment we ever did was comparing 
chicory, red clover and lucerne and looking at the production of them and lucerne was the clear winner. They're also not as long lived so you find that chicory and plantain are more a component in a pasture than they are dominating the pasture. And when you have those in a, a specialist pasture, they're, they're high quality feed as well, so the animals will do well eating them. Um, but they then need a legume associated with them, and you tend to find the live weight gain or the, the production from the animal is actually from them eating the legumes and things around, rather than eating the plantain in particular. Chicory is, is high quality feed. But on a lot of soils in the South Island, um, there are two things happen, they get disease, so they only last three to four years is, is generally what we'd expect out of a, a chicory or a, a plantain plant within a pasture. So they're shorter lived. Have you got experience? Yeah, we're starting to experiment a little bit with chicory. I uh, have for a couple of years. Um, it's certainly a plant with potential. It's got a taproot. Um, doesn't like the dry though. <laughs> um, we found this year it really struggled. Um, we had it, we, we grew up mostly under irrigation. Um, and obviously we had restrictions this year, um, pretty severe restrictions, and it shut down. Um, it grows over a shorter period of time. It is certainly high quality feed and animals do very well on it. Um, we've been saying with red and white clover um, and finding those legumes just certainly can't fix enough nitrogen for it to grow to its potential. So we actually are having to use bad nitrogen. And yeah, we are finding it's, it's not lasting and when I think it's only a two year plant at best um, and may even be just a, an annual crop for us um, in, in our environment. So, but hey, we've got a lot to learn about it, but it's, it's certainly something we're playing around with too. Boyd, I'm interested in how irrigation fits in your Akataramiya system with loosening. I guess traditionally irrigation was seen as you know, the drought the drought proofing mechanism and as well the I guess the way to leverage off the dry part of your farm to um, basically get enough enough food. And I guess given the comment that you just made in, the, in your last answer. How irrigation fits when you're in such a dry area that when it's really dry, you might not actually be able to get water for irrigation. So how does that fit in your farming system with irrigation and particularly with water irrigation? Okay, um, so the first question was around, the, sorry, was around loose and how it fits on the irrigation system. Yep. It's bloody hard to manage under irrigation, to be honest with you. Um, and I, I, I was meaning more as what does that mean what do you now use irrigation for? Basically, in irrigation now in the Hacker Valley, um, we're, we're growing crops. We are starting to grow chicory. We're growing fodder beet, which will fill that void through the winter when, when lucerne's not growing. Um, and we are growing pastures, which are normally short term uh, annual type ryegrasses, or we've gone to a fescue based pasture. Um, now, the reason we've done that in the Hacker Valley I mean, is basically um, our soil temperatures. This year our soil humidity got up to 26 degrees uh, in the Hacker Valley. So your ryegrass clover pastures really struggle, or just basically don't grow, regardless of how much water you tip on them. So yeah, we're treating our, because our, we've only got say 400 hectares of irrigation out of 5,000, it, it's reasonably a small area. So we're using it for specialised cropping to fill um, gaps in our um, overall pasture yields. Um, and yeah, we're not putting lucerne on, I mean, lucerne under irrigation pretty much now. Um, we find it hard to manage, um, and especially in a centre pivot situation, almost impossible to manage because um, the scientists at Lincoln have probably, I think, hit the nail on the head. I mean, lucerne under irrigation, the grazing management, you really, once you've grazed it, you want the lucerne to get some leaf on it before you put the water on, otherwise, all you do is germinate the weeds and you end up with a lot of weed problems. So we've found it, yeah, we're, we're pretty much sticking with the um, lucerne on, uh, on the dry land areas and um, growing crops um, into, to complement it. Um, and of course, you've got, always got the use of cut and carry with lucerne to get you through those periods as well. Is that what you do? Just a, a couple of minor points on that. If someone's got a little bit of irrigation, not a fully irrigated farm, we would normally recommend that you secure your winter feed with that irrigation, so you make sure that you grow the turnip crop, the sweet crop, the Italian ryegrass, whatever it might be, through that summer period when you've got growth. And, and Boyd mentioned also his soil temperature of being 24. Once you have taken the moisture off a, a soil, it is routinely 40 to 45 degrees. 
So because you're no longer evaporating moisture out, the heat load is going straight onto the soil surface. So the soil surface becomes incredibly hot, and it actually physically cooks ryegrass and white clover plants, and that's why they die out in a dry land system. A loose earth plant, the growing point, the bit that's actually producing the leaves, is at the top of the plant. So it's not experiencing those soil temperatures, it's responding to the air temperature, not the soil temperature. So it's that, that's the reason that we lose our ryegrass pastures when they're very hot. Yeah, it's a very valid point, and I think that's one thing that surprised us about lucerne plants, and it comes down to that air temperature, is actually what actually grows a lot quicker in the spring than a lot of people realise, because it's, it's not reliant on the soil temperature, as you know. Now, wet soil takes a long time to heat up, but um, it's more um, responsible for the air temperature than the soil temperature. Okay, one last question. Um, you can graze cattle on lucerne with a, as long as you uh, follow a few basic rules, I guess. And um, in our system, as I mentioned, we we, we grow grass with our lucerne um, for in a grazing management system. We do have straight lucerne, um, and to be honest, cattle don't spend a lot of time on that. And if they're on it, they're normally following a mob of um, lambs around that have already taken the best out of it. But bloke capsules and that sort of thing can help, and, and there will be people out there, Derek will probably know people that are running cattle on, on straight loose. We do it occasionally, and um, yeah, they don't sleep that easily at night, but uh, we haven't had too many disasters. But as I say, we normally transition them through a period where they've actually been on a, uh, a loose end coxwood or a loose end fescue pasture before they before they've go onto a straight loose end paddock, and um, that seems, certainly helps, but you can get caught occasionally. Yep, so. We have animal health rules to help them. Deer also will eat lucerne very happily, and they don't tend to get bloat at all. So um, there's a lot of uh, black and white beef cows being grazed at the moment, and a lot of those are actually being put onto lucerne. And as Boyd just indicated, if you put a mob of ewes and lambs through a paddock first, and let them take the leaf off, and then you follow it with cattle. So there are ways that we have farmers doing that that we, we work with, yeah. Okay, I think we'll, we'll wrap up now. We've gone a little bit over time. Um, I just really want to thank you both, Derek and Boyd, for uh, a really, really interesting talk. And um, just that, the way that you can see the practical end of the science that someone like Derek's involved in is, um, is great to see. And I think um, you, uh, I was just thinking about one comment you made, Derek, about overseer, and you were very polite <laughs> in the way that you said that. But you know, it's um, it's a real concern to us if um, if there are pasture species like lucerne that aren't being represented, and I guess it's the the onus falls on organisations like us to to push for more research into making sure that they are, because whether you like it or not, overseer is being used, <laughs> and um, so it's really really important to get that kind of work done. Um, but mostly, I just want to say thank you very much for a really interesting talk. Thank you.